I'm Nicholas Gvozdev. I'm a professor here uh, at the War College in the National Security Affairs Department. And I'd like to uh, provide just a bit of opening context for this final panel. Uh, this past April, uh, two of my colleagues in the National Security Affairs Department, uh, Joan Johnson Fries and Tom Nichols, writing in World Politics Review, warned about the perils of the division of our national security community into tribes of specialists, policy experts, military officers, scientists, and engineers, and the dangers that can result when these groups cannot communicate effectively with each other. And as they wrote, fed into stovepipes, national security problems get broken into ever smaller but less relevant pieces by experts working in parallel with, but in isolation from each other. And the risk is that policymakers might rely on systems and solutions that technical experts cannot assure them will work, but political advisors insist must be adopted. So our last conversation here today is designed to draw the threads of our forum together from what ought to be done to what can be and is being done currently. Our earlier panels and speakers focused on questions of grand strategy and political, economic, and energy realities. This panel is designed to lay out the practical, concrete steps that are being taken to lessen dependence on conventional sources of energy and to utilize alternatives, but without compromising America's ability to project power and to sustain its role of global leadership. Uh, in introducing our three panel members, their extensive biographies are in the book. I would encourage you all to familiarize yourself with them. Uh, we have an interesting mix of both public and private sector today with us on the panel, and as the Secretary of the Navy noted, it is these private-public partnerships that we expect to work together to provide these types of solutions for the future. So immediately to my right, uh, we have Vice Admiral William R. Burke, the Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Readiness and Logistics, the N4. Mr. Jonathan Wolfson, the Chief Executive Officer of Solozyme, which is a pioneering firm in the areas of renewable oil and the development of bioproducts uh, for energy. And finally, Assistant Secretary of the Navy, uh, Jacqueline uh, Fannensteel, uh, who has energy installations in the environment as part of her, her remit in, uh, in the Department of the Navy. So I'll turn the floor over now to uh, Admiral Burke, and then we'll continue with Mr. Wolfson and uh, Secretary Fannensteel. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, let me just say, Phil, would you please stand up? This is Phil Cullum. He runs Task Force Energy. He has been instrumental in everything the Navy has done in, in energy for the last few years. He is, he is by far our leader. How am I doing so far, Phil? Okay, uh, I, I want to start with a little uh, little joke. Um, there's a priest, it's Sunday morning, it's a beautiful day like it is today, and uh, he decides he wants to play golf instead of do services. And so, so he makes arrangements to, to cancel the services and he, he heads off about 100 miles away to play some golf and he tees off on number one, which is a 400 yard par four, and he hits the best drive of his life right in the hole. St. Peter says to God, why'd you let him do that? God said, who's he going to tell? <laughs> so unlike the priest, I hope you will go tell people what you've seen here these last couple days. and. Uh, and get others to come to uh, future events here at the War College. Okay, uh, before I get started, I want to just break down what we do, our, our approach in the uniform part of the Navy to uh, energy. It's essentially twofold. The first piece is conservation or efficiency. The goal or the reason we do that is to make us better fighters, to make us more capable because that efficiency or conservation leads to immediate additional capability. In other words, if your plane can fly further, uh, has a greater combat radius, you can do more. 
if you, if you use an alternative fuel, you can't necessarily do more. But the alternative fuel is a strategic, pers is, we need to look at that from a strategic perspective. We do not want to be limited by the fuel that we have to import. All right, so let me go to the first slide. Okay, uh, what I'm trying to show here is, uh, this is Afghanistan over here for those that uh, aren't familiar. And these are the, the, the uh, lines of communication that we use to get things into Afghanistan. And you can see going through Pakistan is one way, and this northern distribution route uh, is a long way. Neither of them are very, um, are easy routes. And uh, they're all tenuous at times. And this is what happens sometimes. And, and so this is our, this is our challenge. Now, you may say, okay, that's the, that's the ground war. Um, this is the naval war. Our ships go into port to refuel. We know about coal. Um, I don't know if you know about Global 09, another game that was run up here in 09. Uh, what it showed essentially was that you need to take care of your logistics. If you don't take care of your logistics, you aren't going to be around to fight very long. If you do put too much effort into protecting lo your logistics, you don't have anything left to, to uh, take the fight to the enemy. So very important to us on both a tactical and a strategic level. Let me talk about the, the nation's fiscal challenges. I think most people know this, but if, as you look there on the uh, lower left, you can see what happens over the 10-year period of uh, growth in our, uh, our budget areas. And you can see that if we keep the uh, budget the same, uh, a couple things are gonna get squeezed out. Another thing to note on that slide is, is is please see what interest does over the course of the 10-year period. It goes from roughly $200 billion a year to about three-quarters of a trillion dollars a year to the point where it exceeds the national defense budget. And then you can see the debt burden that, uh, that we face over time. And you can see some of the uh, other countries uh, national debts uh, as a percentage of GDP. And so, you know, the Japanese have a, have a big one, far bigger than ours, but the challenge here is where do we get the money for this? We used to self-finance our own debt. Um, we don't do that anymore. You know, you've probably heard the Japanese, is, the Japanese are a nation of savers. They used to be a nation of savers. They are now spending their money as they age. And so, when they go to fix the problems that they've recently encountered, if they do it by selling debt, they're going to have to, instead of selling it for a 1% to their local populace, it's going to go on the world market and it's going to cost them more. Same challenge we face. Okay, so getting into energy a little bit. Uh, here's our profile of, uh, of where our energy comes, or where we use it and where it comes from. You can see in the upper left, that we spend about three quarters of our energy use on the tactical side and only a quarter on the shore side. Uh, where does it come from? On the tactical side, mostly, it, or half of it comes from petroleum, uh, or more than half comes from petroleum, then there's some nuclear, and then we use some electricity when we're in port, uh, when the ships are in port. On the shore side, you can see most of it's uh, electricity. Now, you've heard you heard the Secretary this morning say, we are a small part of what the nation uses. We are about 2% of what the nation uses in DOD. But you can see that uh, the Navy is only about a quarter of what DOD uses, and then you can see how it's spread amongst, our, uh, <coughs> amongst the, the uh, aviation and maritime. And you can see that we're about a $30 billion a year, $30 million, 30 million barrel a year, uh, force. 
Uh, I think this next slide has kind of been covered. Price is generally going up, and it's been volatile. Um, in the lower left, you, you know, we heard how domestic supply is going down, uh, export or imports are going up. In the lower right, um, not the most friendly countries that have, have the oil. And in the upper right, uh, this won't work for the non-believers in uh, peak oil, but uh, this is a different way of showing peak oil. And you can see that uh, over time, we're not going to be able to extract the oil or it's going to be gone. Okay, so uh, General Flynn talked a little bit about how, uh, how we're doing in the Marine Corps, and I thought I'd talk a little bit about how we're doing in the Navy. In the upper left is, you can see the, the green line, the flat line is the program record, and the, the uh, rising line is, is uh, the barrels that we're trying to save with, we think we're going to save with the POM 12 investment. And we needed to get into that red area uh, shortly after 2020 uh, because that's what we needed to meet the Secretary of Energy's uh, goals. And so, so we had a, a way of targeting our investment to do that. And so what you can see in the, in the upper right is that uh, we will have some savings relative to where we are going. S same sort of thing as what you saw on the left side. In the lower left, what you can see is how we're doing on the ship side is the top part. You can see that we're making progress. On the aviation side, uh, you know, that's a little bit of wishful thinking there is that, that thing, you're not sure whether it's going up or down, but the latest trend is it's, it's going down. So we're making progress in the area uh, we need to. Uh, this, I wanted to put this slide up here because I want to show you how we're, we plan to get there. On the left, you can see where we stand today. Uh, if you said how many barrels of, uh, or a million barrels of oil we use uh, in 08, it's about 40, if we, if we included the nuclear fuel, if the nuclear were replaced by uh, fossil fuels. So you remember a previous slide I showed you were about a 30 million barrel uh, Navy. So we take credit for the nuclear as if, uh, as replacing fossil fuels. And then as you go to the right into 2020, you can see our requirement grows because some of the things that we've bought over the last several years do not have the efficiency we'd like them to have. And so that's what that POM 12 investment does is it tries to buy down some of that, some of that through efficiency. So now you're left with that, uh, that little green area there, the liquid alternatives. And so what, so in my lower right here, what I'm saying is we need fuel today to test, alternative fuels to test. But when we get out in 2020, we need alternative fuels to, to fuel our platforms. This is a genuine demand signal that we need to have. So one of the things Phil, Phil Cullum did was he went to MIT and said, hey, tell us when the alternative fuel situation is going, to is going to be supportive at reasonable prices. Because the 2012 and the 2016, we're paying a premium on that fuel so we can test it and operate with it. But in 2020, we don't want to be paying that, that premium. It's roughly 2020, 2024 time frame where we actually, where MIT actually projects that the alternative fuels would become cost competitive. Okay, I threw a couple slides in here based on what I heard over the course of the, the last couple of days, and this is one of them. I just want to, CNO mentioned about how, uh, how aviation was changing so much in the Navy and how it was a great place to be. It is a great place to be. It's also a very expensive place to be for 
if you're the N4 and you're, you're the guy that's responsible for finding the money to fund operations. You, this is what we project the cost of the, fly, of the flying hour program will be, assuming the price of fuel stays the same. Those green triangles there assume it's going to stay the same. Now, the Secretary told you this morning that the price of fuel uh, just went up by $40 a barrel uh, for DLA. That's the, that's the cost we plan on. And he told you it was going to cost, cost us uh, a little over um, $500 uh, million dollars for the year. What he meant was $500 million for the rest of the year. It's, it's actually about a billion two for the year. So, so these, pro these slides, uh, or this slide, shows a, shows a relatively level cost of the flying hour program at $8 billion. It just went up significantly with that change. Now this is a busy one, and this is not one you'd normally see in an energy brief, but, but this is the effort we're under to try to get a handle on the flying hour program from a cost perspective. So we look at every single type of aircraft, and we are digging into each of those to try to figure out how to drive cost down. And if you, if you look at the blue line relative to the uh, red line, in most cases in the last budget year, we've had success in doing that. So the green triangles there are aligned to the right axis, and you can see that, that most of those are right about zero or less, and that's, that indicates the delta in cost. And so those that are above the, the rotor blade, those are the ones we're going after in a big way. And uh, we have a great effort from the Naval, Naval Air Force and uh, Nav Air to go after that. Okay, a little bit more about what we're doing today. On the maritime side, uh, lighting. I mean, there are so many lights on the ship, and if you put in efficient lights, you can save a bundle both in port and at sea. Uh, the second picture on top there, the stern flaps, designed to make the ship more hydro hydrodynamically sound, goes through the water uh, better. Um, each of these, we're talking about a percent, two percent, maybe three percent. There are no silver bullets in this efficiency uh, effort. We're just trying to save a little bit here and there. But we're also doing hull coatings, uh, propeller coatings, things that make the ship slipperier in the water. Uh, hybrid electric drive, this has tremendous potential. This is probably more than a couple percent. This is the idea that you would take up your platform and rather than running at low speeds, rather than running two separate, uh, one, one uh, turbine for propulsion, another one for uh, electrical loads, you would run them both off the same at low speeds. Therefore, only using uh, um, or using far less fuel, and this one could be a real game changer. We're talking uh, potentially 10 percent here. Uh, in the lower left, uh, this, to talk about the aviation side, we have an energy conservation program. We started it on the ship side, where people would just tell us what their good ideas are, and and then we'd uh, implement them across the fleet. So successful, we're doing the same thing on the aviation side. Uh, the potential in, uh, in aviation is mostly in the engines. If we can get an engine that is, that is both efficient at uh, high speed as well as uh, uh, transit speed or cruise speed, then, uh, then because we have thousands of engines in our, uh, in our Navy, we can make tremendous uh, have a tremendous impact there. And I should say, you know, we, this is naval aviation as opposed to just Navy aviation. Okay. Uh, on the, on the uh, expeditionary side, um, efficient platforms. We're doing uh, a, much, a number of things with our, our landing craft and our amphibious ships that uh, make them more efficient. We're using uh, 
You know, you heard a lot from General Flynn about uh, India Company uh, of 3-5. Um, we're working with uh, doing some of the same things with the Expeditionary Combat Command, and we're also going to do try to do something very similar to what 3-5 did with the SEALs. Uh, and then we're, we're taking these batteries out, out uh, as well. And I, I would like to say that, that one of the most exciting things that's happened in the last year having to do with uh, energy is that we've, we've got Office of Naval Research now focused on energy and efficiency. You know, they, they typically would look at things like ASW and strike, et cetera. Um, but we got them now working on uh, energy, and that has the potential to yield great benefits, particularly in the area of, uh, of batteries, which, which aren't sexy, but those are, those are the, uh, the game changer for the Marines. They're the game changer for UUVs, and we need to get there. On the shore side, um, this is where our efficiency really, really is uh, most mature. And so we're doing all the standard things you'd do to your house. Um, and as the Secretary mentioned, we're building at uh, lead silver and gold levels. But I think the most exciting one is the culture and the behavior. And, and the idea of putting meters into houses and buildings is very powerful. For instance, out in, uh, in Pearl Harbor in the, in the Hawaii region now, all the houses are metered. And so we tell people that you're using too much electricity. And if you do use too much electricity, we charge you for it. If you use less, you, you reap the savings. When we get the, when we get the, the major buildings uh, metered, there are, tr there are tremendous savings because of those big uh, cycling of those big uh, air handlers and, and chillers. Uh, tremendous amount of money to be, to be saved in that regard. And the reason meters are important is because if you know what's going on in your building or know what's going on in your house, you can change what you do. And you can, you can do it without any loss of comfort or ability, but it takes understanding what's happening to be able to do that. Okay, the Secretary mentioned a bunch of testing. On the top row, you can see what we've done as far as testing alternative fuels, 50-50 blends in platforms. On the bottom, you can see the ones that we're going to test in the, uh, over the course of the next uh, year. And I mentioned uh, culture change. There's a couple of things that, uh, that Phil is pushing hard. And those are, we need to get energy efficiency and energy awareness into all our training pipelines so people will understand it. We need to start them out right. We think if we can get people who understand energy efficiency, we should, we should recycle those people into those kind of jobs and reward them for that. Uh, unit incentives can, can recognize people that have done well on the energy side. And then, of course, the acquisition piece is the most important, I think, because we need to get energy efficiency and total ownership cost more broadly a seat at the table in the acquisition, such that we are willing to spend an extra dime here to save a dollar down the road, rather than the other way around, which is what we frequently have done. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Admiral. Mr. Wolfson. Well, thanks for hosting me today. I'm, uh, I'm Jonathan Wolfson. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Solazyme. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Solazyme, and I'm going to tell you a bit about how we've been working with DOD and uh, DLA Energy, and specifically our friends at the Navy, who have been quite supportive. You've heard a lot over the last couple of days about the challenges with oil. And in interests of time and, and, and perhaps keeping you guys awake in this afternoon lull, I'm not going to go through this slide because I think it's relatively self-explanatory. Oil presents very substantial challenges. 
It obviously is the basis for our economy, for our transportation, our energy needs, and even food. But moving forward, we have to make hard decisions. We need to make smart investments, and we need to move forward into the future of a new energy. Solozyme makes oil. We're a renewable oil company. And the way we do that is by taking what the planet's good at making, which are plant sugars, and converting them into what the world needs, which is oil. If you really want to think at a high level about why what we're doing is important and why it provides an important new source of oil, we don't have to look much beyond agriculture. If you think about global arable land, so let's talk about the land that's used on the planet to grow something. Out of all of that land, well over 80% is producing a carbohydrate or plant sugar based crop. Less than 15%, in reality, substantially less than 15%, because soy is kind of an outlier there, is producing oil-based crop. And the reason is because outputs per acre for carbohydrates on a BTU basis are far, far higher. And we're only talking about arable land now. If we take the non-arable land that still has biomass growing on it, it's almost exclusively carbohydrate-based crop, cellulosic. In, in this case. What Solozyme's technology is, is it's the first technology on the planet to convert carbohydrate-based biomass into oil, into a wide variety of oils, to serve everything from fuels to chemicals to nutrition and even things like skin and personal care. But we make oil, and we do it by taking what the planet's good at making, carbohydrates, and converting it into what the world needs. The three main sources of oil touch our lives every day in numerous ways. The three main sources of oil that we use today are petroleum, plant, and animal fat. And, and this is actually really relevant. And one of the reasons it's relevant, we're sitting here talking about energy. But I think people understand that other uses of oil compete with energy. We use oil in many different ways in our daily lives, from the vegetable oil and the detergent that washes our favorite pair of jeans, to the vegetable oil and the paint on our walls, to things we know about, like the animal fat and the butter some of us, like me, still eat on our toast in the morning. We also know about the key uses for petroleum. We know about use for diesel fuel, for jet fuel, but we might not know that mineral oil is in that transformer box outside your house. If you live in the suburbs and if you live in the city, it's that massive transformer box under your building. The point is, these are all competing needs and oil touches our lives in many different ways, so the ability to make renewable oils is vital moving forward. Solozyme's technology is the first technology to produce a new source of oil. And the important point here is, it's a new source of oil, it's not new oil. So again, we're taking plant sugars and we're converting them into oils. But we can convert them into oils with the same profiles as oils that are used broadly today in fuels and chemicals and other applications. And that's particularly important in fuels because we have over 100 years of development of using and building out the petroleum infrastructure. So it's not just transportation of those fuels, it's not just refining of those fuels, it's the specifications for those fuels, it's the warranties by the engine manufacturers for those fuels, which makes it vital to produce oils that can be converted into current fuel specifications today. The way we do this again is by taking biomass-based plant sugars. So it can be anything from sugar cane or sugar beet or sweet sorghum to a wide variety of cellulosic sugars like miscanthus or switchgrass and others. What we do is we feed those sugars to microalgae 
in standard industrial fermentation equipment. So big stainless steel vessels, the kind that have been around for decades, technology very similar to that used to make beer or biopharmaceuticals. But the reason we use algae is because algae is the original oil producer. It's been around for billions of years, evolving to make oil very efficiently. And a lot of the petroleum we pump out of the ground today originated with algae. It just did so hundreds of millions of years ago. And our process uses algae, deploys it in standard industrial fermentation equipment to shorten that process into a couple of days. The other thing that we've managed to do is we've used over 20 years of agricultural biotechnology capability to leverage algae's natural ability to make oil along with the ability to tailor that oil. So what we can actually do is not just produce oil from algae at high volume and low cost, but we can actually tailor the specific profiles in ways that people have not been able to do in nature before. So if you want to think about it from a fuel perspective, I think people who understand the refining industry might think about oil in the, from the perspective of how many carbons is in that oil. And when it gets refined, what are the carbon chain lengths in the end oils? Are they uh, you know, C10, C12 carbons, which are 12 carbon chain lengths, which are used often in aviation fuel? Are they higher C16s and even C18s that are used in things like diesel and marine diesel fuel? When you get a barrel of petroleum, when you pump it out from the ground, you get what you get. And we've developed 100 years of refining capability to do a very good job at leveraging that into a variety of fuels. But what Solozyme does is fundamentally different. We can produce the most valuable cuts of a barrel by tailoring those oils. So why is that relevant? As we face tighter and tighter supplies of cheap oil, we use our technology to tailor for the most valuable cuts of a barrel. So for instance, producing a very light cut of diesel fuel that still meets diesel fuel specifications. So if you came to Solazine now, you could find barrels of a very light cut of diesel fuel. The reason that that's relevant is because that very light cut of diesel fuel can be blended in with much heavier fuels like bunker to uplift everything into marine diesel range. And this is actually really important because it takes a lot of pressure off of declining stores of light, sweet crude oils. We do this again by focusing on the agricultural uh, commodities that are available today at scale. So we look at things like uh, sugar cane, sugar beet, sweet sorghum. But we've also done extensive work on cellulosic biomass, everything from corn stover, miscanthus, switchgrass, bagasse. Um, we've even used co-product streams like the glycerol that comes out of a biodiesel plant. And we've demonstrated that we can produce the same oils on all of these materials. Now, today we're focused on the feedstocks on the left as we scale up because the logistics and availability of those feedstocks are broad and relatively inexpensive. But as we move forward and as the supply chains get worked out for a lot of these cellulosic materials, there's the capability in the United States alone to produce over 65 billion gallons of fuels, which is over 25% of our domestic demand. So there's a lot of biomass and there's an ability to dramatically expand what we're producing. And again, what we're taking is the same kinds of biomass that are used to produce other things and we're converting them into oils. We're not converting into ethanol or other things that are not usable in a lot of the platforms that we need in the military and elsewhere. We're making oils that slip stream right in. So again, this is a slide where you've seen variations over the last two days. I'm not going to spend a tremendous amount of time except to say clearly we have an unstable supply-demand imbalance. The U.S. up there on the top with very modest reserves of petroleum and a very large demand. And as we heard yesterday and again today, the, the growth of China is skewing this even further. And on the right, we also listened 
to a lot about these demand choke points, places like the Straits of Malacca, places that require tremendous maritime resources to protect those precious flows. Our technology gives us the ability to take biomass locally, convert different kinds of biomass into the same type of oil for refining into fuels. I don't expect this to take all of the pressure off of these choke points, and what we're doing is not intended to full-scale to full replace petroleum. But it can make a dent, it can make an important dent, and it can make a very strategic dent. I'm not going to stand up here and talk more about peak oil. You can take whatever side of that argument you want. I think you can probably guess where I come out on that one. But the practical matter is, as, as um, one of our speakers said yesterday, the era of cheap oil is over. And we've also spent the last couple days talking a lot about economic challenges in this country and abroad. So the end of cheap oil puts additional pressure on us from a strategic standpoint, and coming up with alternatives is an imperative. It is an economic imperative, it is a jobs imperative, and a national security imperative. We've been fortunate over the last few years to work with DLA Energy and the Navy in a number of different projects to demonstrate that alternative liquid transportation fuels can replace petroleum-based fuels in our tactical warfighting platforms. We actually started quite a bit, we started actually more than three years ago working with the Navy. And since then, we've delivered um, quite a bit of HR F-76, which is a renewable version of F-76, uh, marine diesel fuel. We've delivered smaller quantity of HRJ-5, which is a JP-5 analog. And we have quite a bit more sitting in, uh, sitting in storage tanks waiting for pickup by the Navy as well. The important part of this slide, though, is these quantities may look small to those of you who understand the energy complex, but what they constitute is the largest deliveries of an advanced microbial biofuel in history. And that means produced by anyone and delivered to anyone. And the most important point about that, from my perspective in this room, is that the demand for that came from the U.S. Navy. The U.S. Navy stood up years ago and said, we believe there's a future. We understand it's important to create liquid transportation alternatives. And they've been an outstanding partner to Solozyme to let us scale up and demonstrate that we can produce these fuels. Our refining partner on these projects has been UOP, which is a Honeywell division. And we've been producing fuels that meet what I would say are very strict specifications. And there's at least a couple people in the room that might smile at this because I'm more than happy to say that the specifications that we've met are quite a bit stricter than those for the petroleum-based fuels. I think the Navy, in its wisdom, saw this as an opportunity to, to find out exactly how far alternatives could go, since there really haven't been alternatives to petroleum. And I'm very happy to say that between our work in tailoring the oils and working with world-class refining partners like UOP, we've been able to hit these extremely demanding specifications. We've also had these fuels tested, although we usually find out about the tests after they've occurred. It still makes us happy when we get to see the video of a Seahawk taking off and uh, a riverine command boat running on a 50% blend of our fuel. The environmental impact of these fuels is also vital, and it's, it's, it's vital from a strategic perspective. I may have kind of brushed aside the issue of peak oil, but I won't brush aside the issue of global warming. It's happening. And it has strategic implications, and we heard about them yesterday from the CNO and others. It is occurring. And we have 
a responsibility as we move into the future to protect the planet for future generations and to make sure that we don't cause additional global upheaval. The planet is warming. And we've worked with a variety of independent third parties to demonstrate that our fuels can reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 60 to over 90 percent, depending on which fuels and exactly which metrics. But in every case, very strong decreases in greenhouse gas emissions. And this is full life cycle we're talking about, literally field to wheels. We've also worked with uh, folks at uh, NREL, uh, National Renewable Energy Lab, to demonstrate that we're not just reducing greenhouse gas emissions, we're also reducing other unwanted emissions like particulates, carbon monoxide, and other things. I, I, I noted an article this morning that some of you guys may have seen in the Houston Chronicle talking about uh, a bill that, uh, uh, that's out right now um, trying, to, uh, trying to strike down Section 526. And, uh, and, and here's my three cents worth. Um, Section 526 is actually important. It forces us to do things that will be in our strategic best interests ultimately. And it's not just Solazine. There are an entire army of companies with technologies that are being developed. So although I'm talking about Solazine, I'm talking about Solazine because it's, it's my company, it's the company I love. But the reality is we really are at an inflection point. If you went, for instance, to the National Venture Capital Association website and you looked at spending over the last 10 years, you would see something very interesting in venture capital. An enormous amount of venture capital funding has shifted toward clean energy, renewable energy, over the last 10 years. And yes, you obviously will always have people who are over-promising and under-delivering, which makes people question whether it's real, but it is. It is real, and over the next few years, we're going to see a lot of technologies emerge that have been seeded over the last decade. We've scaled up this technology. We've gone from test tubes to shipping rail cars. For people who think about the growth and demonstration of technologies, you realize that it is that transition from the lab and from small pilot scale to being able to ship rail cars, which is the thing that you cross your fingers about, that you spend enormous sums of money on, and you hope happens. And in the energy complex, it's more vital than anywhere else. And we have made that transition. And there are other technologies in areas adjacent to us in the same area and in other areas of renewable energy that have either made that transition and you haven't heard about it yet or will. There really is a change coming. So in summary, you know, people think that, you know, these are, you know, benchtop processes and companies in this space are um, living off the government. I hear that a lot, actually. I hear about how, um, you know, because we have, a, we have a, a grant with the Department of Energy and we've been working with DOD, I, I very often hear people say to me, well, do you think it's reasonable that the federal government is funding what you do? And my answer is, the federal government is funding a relatively small piece of what I do. The vast majority of the funding that we've raised and invested has been private capital, and I mean the vast majority. But the government has been very strategic, and DOD, DLA Energy, and the Navy have been incredibly helpful at lifting us by asking for these quantities. The demand signals are vital. Solazime's a public company with over a billion dollar valuation, market cap today, and there are others in the marketplace that have the same metrics and that are growing and that are building plants. We're delivering in-spec fuels that meet very tight fuel specs that are being tested in a variety of platforms. And we have technology which can be deployed at various points in the U.S. and around the world on a variety of carbohydrate-based feedstocks, whether they're crop-based or, you know, prairie land or other. And, uh, and it, it appears I'm out of time, but I want to thank you all for, uh, for letting me get up here and speak. And I really, really, again, I want to thank the Navy for being as foresighted 
as it is being in looking forward to alternatives for liquid transportation fuels. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. We were really afraid we'd be speaking to an empty room by this point. Um, normally, I would be going through a presentation that would talk about why the Navy's doing what we're doing, the Department of the Navy's doing what we're doing in energy, um, what it is we're doing, and how we're going to go about doing it. But frankly, in this last day and a half, just about everything I would have said has been covered. Not a bad thing. I mean, it's sort of good. Um, so what I'm planning to do instead, sort of walk through with a, a different view. I, I want to try to both summarize what I've heard for the last day and a half, and I think most of it is, is captured in, in the few slides that I have, but also to try to synthesize it, and synth synthesize it in, in terms of really two questions. The first one is, is this the moment? We heard several times yesterday, and then the Secretary of the Navy said it again today, that this is the moment where we're about to see a fundamental change in our relationship to energy, in the way we, we procure, we produce, we consume energy. And, and so think, as, as we, we think through the, the last day and a half, is that true? Are you, are you believers in that? And then the next question to that is, well, what is the, what is the Navy doing? What are the Navy strategies um, doing that will help that? Is, or are we going to be a big player in making this moment happen? Um, and I'll offer a caution. And the caution is, it's been 40 years since the Arab oil embargo. And over the course of those 40 years, we've seen oil price spikes before, we've seen technological changes before, we've seen government strategies, there's been an awful lot of starting and stopping. And, and I know this because I started in the energy field those 40 years ago, just at the time of the oil embargo. And I've been with it the whole time, with the, the spikes and the, the lows, and, and it's been promised many times before that this will be the moment. So let's think about whether there's something fundamentally different here that, that might make a difference. We'll start with the fact that President Obama does truly support what the Department of the Navy is doing in energy. He's been a big supporter just very recently, just a couple months ago, he challenged the Department of the Navy along with the Department of Energy um, and the private sector to work towards these biofuels, to, to find the biofuels that will work for our needs but also for the commercial sector. So it's, it's part of what he believes in. Why are we doing this? I think virtually every speaker over the last day and a half has explained why we're doing it. And I think Secretary Mavis said it very clearly this morning. We're doing it because energy is our greatest vulnerability. Is we have tactical reasons, we have enormous strategic region, ge geopolitical reasons, and we have climate reasons. So we need to be focusing on energy differently. Um, uh, how, how much energy do we use? I think uh, Admiral Burke just, just talked about this. And it's a question of are we big enough to matter? Does it, what the Navy do, does it really matter in, in the grand scheme of things? And, you know, the answer is yes. We're big. We're not the biggest player necessarily. The, the commercial airline industry, for example, uses much more aviation fuel than we do, but we're big enough to make a difference. Um, I, you just saw this bit about our, our profile, but I, I'd point out to me the, the real key here is that the, the 2575. The 25% that we use sort of onshore in installations 
um, is more the kind of energy um, that we're more familiar with. It's, it's buildings, it's non-tactical vehicles, it's things that we are, we, we more or less have a, a handle on. The tactical, the 75 percent, you know, the ships, the planes, the, the tactical vehicles, very hard to get at with our conventional way of thinking about energy. So let me just uh, reinforce for people who, who I'm sure has all, have all seen Secretary Mavis's um, five energy goals. Um, but the point of them is that they're not marginal, they are transformational. You know, when the Department of the Navy is able to provide 50% of its energy consumption from alternative sources, that means that we have transformed what we do. We are at a different place vis-a-vis -vis energy. Each one of these is a measure of a big change in what we do. The last one, by the way, the energy efficient acquisitions, is, is a little different than the others because it is directed towards the future. It says that our future platforms will use energy differently. And so it's not just near-term existing platforms that we're talking about. We're talking also about what to do in the future. And th this slide summarizes, I think, what a lot of people have talked about in terms of how we're doing what we're doing. And it's, it's really three parts. We're going to reduce demand through efficiency programs. We're going to increase alternative supplies through renewables and, and alternative fuels. And we're going to look for that change in behavior. And we have to do that both on shore and tactical applications, um, some very conventional but, but low-hanging fruit of buildings. We're going to do buildings differently. We're going to do lighting differently. Um, we have an enormous variety in our renewables program ashore. We're looking at all the technologies. There's, you know, we have solar going in. We'll have 100 megawatts of solar. We have about 100 installations throughout the world between the Navy and the Marine Corps. So those 100 installations, some have very good access to solar, great sun, some have wind, some have geothermal. We're looking for what, are they, what does each one have to offer. The question of the tactical applications, as I say, is, is quite a bit harder because they're, they're, not, um, they're, they're not ones that we have looked at, we as an as a energy society have spent much time on, and now we're looking more, more closely. And I would say the two big areas here, and we'll see them, we'll see the pictures again that we've already seen of solar um, applications in, in theater. And what Jonathan was really just talking about, the biofuels as a, as a major part, be a really big part of what we can achieve. Um, let me point out for a minute, what you don't see here on this list anywhere is a magic bullet. There's nothing here that says, aha, we're waiting for that one breakthrough. And once that happens, we can forget everything else. And that's whether it's nuclear or shale or any number of everybody has their own favorite thing that's going to make the difference. Um, there are always those things that are five years out, and they've been five years out for the last 20 years, and you know, so taking those off the table. Um, but I will emphasize again the behavioral change, um, and I, I think that um, Catherine Kelleher said it well yesterday that, that actually it's going to come from within. The big changes are going to come from within. They're going to be us. We're going to relate differently to energy. And, and that's absolutely the case. These are pictures that you've seen somewhat before. Um, it's largely what General Flynn talked about yesterday, what we're doing tactically in the field, what the Marines are doing in Afghanistan. They're bringing different solar applications, different battery chargers, so they don't have to carry the batteries, that they have it there. Um, I have a video that goes in this. If you can roll the video for this. Well, specifically, we just did an op where we were going to have to be outside these, uh, the FOB for an extended period of time. And uh, we brought these, uh, this system called Spaces with us. It's uh, solar panels that pack into our packs, and uh, they recharge batteries for us. Being on platoon commander, if I do not have a radio, 
I'm lost. I have to be able to talk to my boss and tell him everything that's going on all the time. So generally speaking, on an op where we're going to be out for two, three weeks, I'll carry enough batteries with us for three, four days, which is a lot of weight for one, and it takes up space where I can't put stuff like amp. Um, so not only that, but it's just heavy. Um, so we brought the spaces with us, and we brought a very small amount of batteries with us. And we stayed out for three weeks, and we didn't need a battery resupply once, for example. So that was huge. And like I know the Marines love that space system. As far as um, having stuff on the FOB with like the green systems, the, the, with the right amount of panels, that stuff will power everything that we need, which will then, the generator I have outside takes about 25 gallons a day, uh, you know, on average. Um, that's 25 gallons a day I don't have to have replenished. So you figure that's, you know, X amount of gallons a week per month, and that's how many convoys have to get brought out here to resupply some fuel. So just got talking about the IED threat, having guys on the road bringing fuel. I wouldn't want to be the guy driving a fuel truck in an IED environment. Either. So it cuts down on our need to resupply on gas, really. Um, not only that, but generators are very uh, catchy or touchy. So uh, this room is being lit up right now by solar power, for example. I see why so I don't know. I'm gonna, I was a little skeptical at first of something new that we had to try out. Um, completely sold on it. I think it's a great thing. Says it better than anybody else could. As General Flynn points out, the Marines aren't testing this equipment, they're using this equipment. And it's working, and they're some of the greatest advocates now. One of the Secretary's goals is to sail a great green fleet. Why are we going to do this? Why is this so important? Well, the real reason is that when the U.S. Navy proves that it can work, the world pays attention. We did it in 1907 with a great white fleet, when President Roosevelt deployed the, the great white fleet around the world. So what this means is we're going to put together the various technologies and, and applications strategically and methodically going through the various component parts of the great green fleet to get it to sail by 2016. We have a, a schedule, a plan, and, and the point here is that this isn't just an aspirational goal. This isn't just something that we say, wouldn't this be cool if somebody did this? We have a plan to get there. It relies a lot on developments in existing technologies, on alternative fuels, on, on a program to get it there. So this morning you heard Secretary Mabus um, talk ab about how uh, passionate he is about energy and why it is so important to what we do. He said this is the moment for fundamental change. And we heard that same st statement from, from many of the speakers over the last day and a half. So I've been pondering that and trying to say, well, what's different now? What is different now from the past 40 years when we have kept thinking that we were about there? We have high oil prices right now, but we've had high oil prices before. And you know, people make marginal changes, and the oil prices go back down, and, and people forget about that. We have evolutionary, and in some cases, tech, uh, revolutionary changes in, in some technologies, whether it's technologies for wind or technologies for, for alternative fuels. Some consumer preferences are changing in interesting ways. And again, sort of the Prius example, People kind of are, are willing to try this technology, and then they love it, and then it, it gets caught, catches on. But I think, from, from my perspective, looking out, what's more fundamental is that the Department of the Navy is using its, its buying power, its power as a consumer, to link up with business. And we're doing it, uh, the two big examples I'll use is the, the biofuels effort that, that Jonathan just talked about. It's we have a need. We need biofuels to meet the goals. We need biofuels to get off of, of imported oil. 
And so we've made that need known to the business community and they've come to us. They've come to us with private capital. Um, small government um, funds leveraged against private capital. That's huge. We also, another example I'll use is, is the, the XFOBs, the Expeditionary Forward Operating Bases. And again, the Marines have said, we need technologies to bring into theater and have invited the business community to come on to the Marine bases and, you know, both at 29 Palms and Quantico, I think, to show them, say, show us your technologies because we need to buy some. And the business community, the, the, the producers of this equipment have been delighted to meet that need. And so the Department of the Navy is, is matching the needs of our, our needs for strategic and, and tactical reasons and going out to the business community to work in partnership. So what do I think is different this time? I think that we have the chance, and I think we're on the path, to push this over the top, push this over the tipping point. And as somebody who's been waiting 40 years to see this happen, I'm very excited. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. I think this has uh, been a fascinating discussion. It calls to mind a comment that former Secretary of Defense and former Secretary of Energy James Schlesinger said a few years back, which is that the solution, finding an alternative to the liquids, uh, is really a way to rejuvenate American power uh, in the coming century. And I think all three of our speakers also reiterated a point that uh, for those of you that are interested, a recent RAND Corporation report on alternative fuels for military applications that James Bardis and Lawrence Van Biber uh, produced that said that these efforts uh, using the Department of Defense and the Department of the Navy as uh, stimulators to the commercial markets and finding that seed money and a little bit of capital and partnering with the, uh, with the private markets uh, in the end, as they said, could lead to a commercial alternative fuels industry producing the strategically important amount of fuel for the United States and then all the benefits that would redound from that, which isn't simply that the military cuts its fuel costs, but that you could have things such as uh, strengthening the energy supply chain against disruptions so that when you have hurricanes uh, that uh, cause problems in the southeast, you don't uh, disrupt the uh, uh, national fuel chain because you have alternatives in place. You reduce the greenhouse gases and uh, you pump more money into the American economy rather than sending it overseas. I think we have a lot uh, of interesting points uh, to bring uh, to the table now, so I will turn to everyone for questions. Encourage again any of the students in the audience to address questions to the panel. And uh, just a reminder, uh, do use the microphones when you ask your questions because this, uh, this is being broadcast to other parts of the college so that they can hear the question as well as the answer. Sir. Press the button. There we go. Uh, my name is Don Tollison from Philadelphia, and I had a question for either uh, Madam Secretary or the Admiral. Is there another country whose Navy is taking the initiative with green in, in any big way or even a small way? Second of all, when the Secretary mentioned that um, there will be over 100 countries represented when you have naval leaders come here, is this something where sharing information and working with them would help advance it both for us and obviously them. And lastly, is there any adversarial issue here? For instance, the, the hull coatings. Is that something that if you shared that technology with a non-ally, whether they're an adversary or you don't know, that it could someday come back to, to bite us because it makes them a better battle navy? Um, let, let me start with the first question about are there other navies who are doing this? It's interesting, you should ask, I asked that exact question of the Secretary this morning, because um, he's been traveling all over the world, meeting with, with navies all over the world. Um, and I know that there are some, some countries in the world who are doing a lot on renewable energy and alternative fuels. And the answer is, not really. There's not a lot else going on um, in other navies or at least that we, we have seen, not that it's a, um, from other countries, 
Um, in terms of sharing, I'm all for it. I mean, most of what we're talking about um, is technology that can be used. You know, it's, it's commercially available technologies, um, applications that I think that we would like to see more of a critical mass developing for many of these products. As for whether there's anything kind of, um, classified or potentially um, that you wouldn't want to share, I don't know, maybe Admiral Burke would have any thoughts on that. Um, first of all, on the other navies piece, uh, we routinely meet with other navies. Uh, the CNO meets with his counterpart, and I usually attend those meetings. And uh, whenever I ask the question, uh, there, there aren't other navies that are, seem to be taking the same interest in this that we are. And I would agree with uh, the Secretary with regard to, uh, with regard to coatings uh, and such. There's a technology transfer regime we have, and, uh, and it would seem to me that coatings would probably be uh, something that we'd be happy to transfer, and, and, uh, and we'd like to see other folks uh, using them to save energy as well as uh, see our businesses uh, make the money on it. My question is for Mr. Wilson. Uh, the ethanol conversion has turned out to be a, a, an energy loser as well as an inferior product. Uh, your process is, is different. What is the energy efficiency of your product from seed oil drop, which is an equivalent product. How does it compare? So I guess I would clarify a bit. I understand the question. I think that when you say ethanol is an energy loser, what you're referring to is you're referring to corn-based ethanol. And because the ethanol process itself is actually a pretty efficient biological process. The other thing I would say, well, I, was, just, I was talking about total energy inputs. The I, grows, I, I, I understand. I think I think I get it. And and the, the, what I would say is, despite what I believe is a lot of negative press, and despite real challenges with the use of corn, I actually don't believe that corn ethanol is net energy negative. I think there's a fair body of evidence that it may be in the order of one and a half to two x energy positive, as opposed to energy negative. However. One and a half to two x energy positive isn't necessarily what we're looking for in many cases because there are other there are other challenges with respect to ethanol. Ethanol really only works in gasoline engines. Well, it's been tried in other engines, but it's really limited to gasoline engines. And I think one of the other important things is we're looking to reduce our reliance on petroleum is looking to efficiency and. Diesel engines are far more efficient. They're roughly a third more efficient on average. And we're, we, we would like to use technologies that can, uh, that can feed more efficient combustion engines. But as to answer your question directly, the first thing I'll say, which is not direct, is it depends on what feedstock we use. But for instance, if we're using something like sugarcane, it's probably eight to one in terms of energy return on energy invested in that vicinity. Just in the row there, sir. Excuse me. Uh, I'm sorry. Admiral, one question for you, and Jonathan, one question to you. Admiral, uh, I just read uh, a week ago that they sent the UAV from the West Coast to Australia, 8,000 plus nautical miles. Uh, you spend in the military a lot of time in loitering observation, looking for people in danger, uh, would the UAV be far more energy efficient in terms of uh, the omission and could it be accomplished? And uh, Mr. Wolfson, uh, does your product compete with the food chain? By that I mean fertilizer, land, water, and so forth, therefore possibly raising the price of food. I'm not sure I understood your question, but I, th I think you said, do we have reason to loiter, and uh, would we like to be more efficient in that regard? Is that about right? With the UAVs, for example. Yes, yes sir. Um, we do lots of loitering with UAVs today. Um, as a matter of fact, 
uh, the services are driven to distraction to provide all the UAV coverage that we that we uh, can, particularly the Air Force. They're very challenged to get what is required out in the into the field. Um, but we look for uh, in the Navy in particular. We're looking for uh, UAVs that will provide uh, more reach on our carriers, or uh, or give us. A float option. So we're trying to stay away from shore-based stuff, but we definitely want uh, maritime-based uh, UAVs and are well into development in several of those. And uh, one of the criteria for those is how efficient can they be, how long can they loiter. And so uh, the, whatever the technology is to, uh, to get us there is what we're after. Uh, to answer your question, with respect to competition for food, I would say that it depends on what kind of biomass input we use in the process. And we've developed a technology that can broadly take carbohydrates, whether they're crop-based carbohydrates or non-crop-based carbohydrates, and convert them into oil. I guess the way I, would, the way I would suggest you think about it is like every important technology that you can think of that's ever been developed. We can only pick a few for purposes of ease in the room. Let's take a few that the military has been behind. So let's take semiconductors and the internet. I think everybody in this room can come up with some very good uses for the internet and semiconductors and some very bad uses for both. Every important technology I, th I can think of can be used in positive ways or less positive ways. The sustainability of our process depends on the sustainability of the inputs. And so we really focus on having a broadly capable technology platform which can take carbohydrates in and produce a variety of tailored oils. And we focus ourselves for our own business, we focus on finding very sustainable sources of biomass that don't compete with food, that have low water usage or low fertilizer usage. But that's an appropriate way to think of the technology. Thank you, Jonathan Chanis, Torrington, Connecticut. Um, my question is for Mr. Wolfenson. The product you've delivered to the Navy, uh, um, what's the final cost of production on a barrel of oil equipment basis? What feedstock have you used to produce this product? And what has to occur in the technology or the process to make it competitive with the $100 oil? So the, the, the first answer to your question is the projects that we've been working on with the Navy have been R&D projects. So they've included R&D components and delivery, and it's not, on a, it's not on a per gallon basis. So there is no set dollar per gallon that we've been delivering fuel to the Navy on. Is it 150, 200 dollars? It's, it's substantially in excess of what you would pay if you went to the pump. Okay, and, 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 and so let me be clear, because you're asking a question that gets a lot of political currency from a lot of people. A lot of people, in this room might not ever question how much it costs to develop an ejector seat for a military airplane, right? They would never think about that. But everybody in the world is concerned about what every gallon of developmental fuel we deliver costs because they go to the gas station and they fill their own tanks. What we're doing is developmental work and our contracts with the Navy are R&D contracts. They cost substantially in excess of a, standard, uh, of a standard gallon of fuel that the military would buy today, but the costs have come down dramatically over the three years that we've been working with DOD. And, uh, and, and in answer to your last question, <clears throat> we are publicly stating that if we were running in a large commercial facility that was dedicated to fuel production, we would be producing oil at under $1,000 a metric ton, which is about $140 a barrel if we were running in a large fit-for-purpose facility today. Now, just to be clear, we're making tailored oils, so we're making the most valuable cuts of a barrel. So we're making oils that are actually worth two or $300 a barrel when you blend them in on an economic perspective but the costs of production would be under $140, roughly $140 a barrel in a fit-for-purpose plant. If I could chime in on that and just say that uh, so some of the research that, that I think I mentioned that MIT had done for us um, indicates that uh, 
they think the, in the alternative fuel markets that uh, the cost of fuel will be competitive with petroleum prices in about 10 years. And, and if I may add on, there may be actions we can take that would accelerate that 10-year period. I mean, I think that we're moving towards parity with oil, and it really is just a question of timing and what we can do to, to make that faster. For the record, my perspective is dramatically shorter than 10 years. I mean, our, our technology is much more robust than that, and, uh, and what we're doing is we're, we're working on building large-scale commercial plants today. We've spent, the last, uh, we've spent the last eight years driving hard down those cost curves and, and investing large sums of money into it, and, uh, and uh, so I would expect to see, uh, I mean, parity with petroleum shifts with the price of petroleum. It's also, by the way, in my opinion, a red herring comment because the reality is that the uh, large oil and gas companies have had 100 years to bury subsidies in every single place you can look. So parity is not parity. But notwithstanding that, uh, a lot less than 10 years. I also, a question for Mr. Wolfson. Uh, my name is Patrick Williams. I'm from the uh, Aberdeen Proving Grounds in Maryland. Um, this question about your product, is it, is it intended to be a uh, standalone, so to speak, fuel source, or is it intended to be blended with um, traditional petroleum distillates? And uh, if I could add a follow-up efficiency question to one that was asked previously. Um, I was wondering if you had any data on the thermodyna thermodynamics of your product that you could share. I mean, specifically, I'm asking, um, can you recover the same amount of mechanical work from a unit of your biodistillate as you can from a unit of a petroleum distillate? So let me answer the second question first, but let me ask you to repeat the first question. Would you, would you be willing to do that? Sure. I was just wondering, is your product intended to be blended with a, a traditional fuel, or can it be a standalone fuel source on its own? Both. Both. Now, you can imagine in the early days, it makes a lot of value to you. It, it makes a lot of sense from an economic perspective to shoot to uplift things like bunker and other fuels to diesel range. And so you'll see a lot of blending in the earlier phases of commercialization. With respect to the second question, what we're talking about on an energy basis, on a BTU basis, is essentially identical to, um, to you know, JP5 or F76. And in fact, those are part of the specs that we're hitting. Has to have the same energy, has to have the same energy density per volume, essentially. That's true, Admiral. Why don't you fly an F-18 with 100% JP-5 from Mr. Walton? I don't mean it to be funny. I'm Thank you sure. for the question. <laughs> uh, you know, what we're planning on doing is using 50-50 uh, blends. And the reason we're planning on using 50-50 blends is we think, one, that's, that's where it's going to go commercially initially. And such, so that if we plan for, for that, then we'll be able to handle anything between 50/50 and 100% uh, petroleum. We don't think that we will we will see uh, pure alternative fuels in the near term. And so we're we're testing our engines to to accept those 50/50 blends. And as the as the uh, market matures, then we'll look at those at those options as well. I'd like to ask Mr. Wilson, how long do you think it would be before you could supply all his aviation fuel? Well, I don't think our target is to supply all of, his, all of the Navy's aviation fuel needs. I, I think the, the answer is we'll be scaling up over the, over the, coming, over the coming years. I'm, I'm uh, unfortunately in a, uh, an SEC period where I can't make any forward-looking statements. So, but notwithstanding that, um, notwithstanding that, the, the point that, that uh, Assistant Secretary Fannin made was that this is part of a silver buckshot approach and not a silver bullet approach. We're not going to replace all the petroleum demands. We can, pr we can replace uh, a very large percentage of the liquid demands, but ultimately what we need to do, for instance, in this country is reduce gasoline demand. 
and because there are competing technologies that make sense, um, like electric for personal transportation, and focus on using liquid for things that aren't going to be fully replaced by uh, electric anytime soon, like aviation and diesel. And, uh, and so our goal is, is to work as, as part of that solution. Could I just throw in, I think it's a long time before we could, we could possibly see the fuel supply around the world such that it's pure uh, biofuel. It's more likely that we're going to have a mixture everywhere we go, so that's, that's what we want to be ready for. Got a lot of questions on the list. I don't know if we'll be able to get to all of them, so I apologize in advance, sir. Uh, Mr. Wolfson, is it possible to use uh, the uh, stack gases from uh, commercial power plants to fertilize your algae and that's uh, sequester it as well as generate fuel? No. <laughs> Simple enough. Catherine? I'll see if I can do it without a microphone. Then, well, if you could, because then people in the other seminars can't hear you. Can't hear your question. I'd like to pass a challenge to the panel as a whole. Um, all of you, and I too, would like to believe that this time's different. Uh, we've been there before. Think of the major alternative fuel work that was done even during World War II. Um, the question is, if you had to recommend one action to take place in the next decade that would ensure that this time is different, that we stay with our investments, regardless of what new uh, resources are found or new places to exploit, what would you recommend to um, President or even the Secretary of Defense as what should be done uh, to ensure that this time we continue to think about what the alternatives not only can be, but must be that we have available in time of crisis. I'll take a crack at that, Catherine. Thanks for the question. And my uh, colleagues here on the panel are thanking me for taking the first crack at it. <laughs> Um, if it were up to me, I, I think that the way I would go is I would take one of the things that Amory talked about at the opening um, yesterday, and that is I, I would focus on getting, um, in getting into more efficient automobiles because I think the you know, it's, it's hard for me to believe that, that our culture is going to change so much that we're going to be heavily interested in mass transportation unless, uh, you know, f for the standard um, going to the grocery store, going to do this, going to do the, that. So, if, but if we can get into more efficient vehicles, that is, the, that's where we spend all our money today in, uh, in petroleum, so so I think that's the one I, I would do. And, and you know, of course, there's all sorts of policy ways you can do that, uh, economic ways you can do that. But that's the area I'd focus on. Do I have to do a second? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, more bill. Um, I, I, you know, the answer in this is way out of my political um, capability of, of talking about. And it really is from my, my prior position rather than, than the position I have now. Um, I think we need the gas tax. I think we need a substantial way of pricing gasoline at the pump <clears throat> as, you know, to, to get to the vehicles. But I do think that that will change whether it's at the pump or some other some other way, but but that will change America's relationship to um, what is now the easy way of doing everything is, which is just to to buy um, 
the, the diesel, the petroleum as is. And we're subject then to the price volatility. I would keep, I would keep a stable price and, you know, that would then make so many more of our technologies economic. We could use the money for, for research. Um, I think that's something that, that many people much, much wiser and smarter than I have developed um, quite in, in quite de in some depth. Um, and politically, it doesn't seem to be going anywhere and sort of never has. But it strikes me that that would make an enormous difference. What they said. <laughs> Well, I'm sorry, uh, we have run out of time for this session. Uh, and hopefully our speakers may still be available for some private uh, Q&A further on, but uh, to keep us on schedule, we'll have to call the formal part to a close here. I'd like to ask you all to join me in thanking our three speakers.